Hey everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in. Um, winding down my day, had to stop and take care of something after I left the office, about to head to the house. Um, have a few other things I need to do to wind down, but uh, try to spend some time with baby and the kids. And obviously my kids ain't kid kids, but you know, which means they ain't trying to really be around me too much unless they want something. But anyway, uh, again, uh, we're in the middle of a fundraiser. If you believe in the work that we're doing in the community, uh, with young black boys, young black girls, uh, feeding uh, the homeless, a bunch of other things, but definitely right now we're on a push for getting support for the Black Man League Rite of Passage Initiative, which is a full service wraparound Everything from a rite of passage to providing mental health services, uh, developmental services, dealing with a bunch of challenges uh, that a lot of people aren't even aware that young black males deal with. And we need your support. If you follow me anytime, you know I've been doing this for a while. None of this is new to me. I didn't just pop up on the scenes a couple of years ago. I've been doing this for a while and I'm committed to it. It's my uh, life's work. It's my passion. And we really need to focus on doing a better job with properly socializing and preparing young black men to step out and do what's necessary um, to empower young black men, young black males, uh, young black boys to become powerful, strong, functional, and pro-social black men. And with that being said, I'm gonna move into what I'm talking about. To me, on a lighter note, but definitely a lesson to be learned in what we're gonna talk about today. So, as the title suggests, I'm asking just how black is Mike McDaniels? For those of you who don't know who Mike McDaniels is, he is the new head coach of the Miami Dolphins, uh, was the offensive coordinator for the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, and is replacing black head coach uh, Brian Flores. Uh, and there's a lot going on there because Flores, after being fired and what he believed to be looked over or mishandled in other interviews, uh, has filed a class action lawsuit against the NFL and several other teams for uh, racial, high, racial discrimination in the hiring processes for head coaches and other uh, front office and lead positions and so the, it's a buzz going on around now some teams are scrambling uh, to look better I know that the Texans hired Lovey Smith I believe Lovey Smith was a good hire uh, my question is did they hire him and put him in a situation where they're going to allow him to build a team and build a culture that can win you know Lovey Smith took a team to the Super Bowl where he faced off against another black coach in Tony Dungy, who actually won. Uh, first time in the history and the last time that two black coaches were in the Super Bowl, which is a phenomenal feat when you understand just how few black head coaches were in the league. Now, the let me say this and, I, and then I'll move on. I am a believer that the best person should get the job. I don't think you should get the job just because you're black. I think you should get a, an equal opportunity to prove that you're the best person for the job. Uh, I also don't think you need to be used to plug into losing situations to take the losses. And then as things get better because of the losses in, in, in sports, just so those of you who may not understand, when your team loses, you get to pick from the lot of college players. When your team loses, the more your team loses. The team with the worst records gets to pick first from the best players coming out of college. So ultimately, you get a chance to get better because your talent lot gets better. Well, there's this practice that goes on in the NFL. When a black coach is given a team, normally he's given a team that's on the downward turn. Uh, the talent isn't there for them to win. They're in a losing situation. They fired someone and they put them in a situation where they're going to take a couple of years of losses and may even get better 
but not have a real chance at playing for a championship. And then they get fired, and then they bring in a white coach to take the team they built. Matter of fact, speaking about uh, this happening, Tony Dungy is the perfect example. We talked about Tony Dungy playing Lovey Smith in the Super Bowl. Uh, and it was at, the crazy thing is it was in Miami, uh, the Super Bowl. And we're talking about Lovey Smith uh, Dun and Dungy won that Super Bowl. But what a lot of people don't remember or a lot of people don't know is that Tony Dungy had did a lot of good work in Tampa Bay building the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And they were on the upswing. They were literally winning and growing. And they fired Tony Dungy and brought in John Gruden, who won the Super Bowl with the team that Tony Dungy built. They literally handed him a Super Bowl team, and he won with a team and a culture somebody else had already created. And, you know, what I love about that situation is that Tony Dungy went somewhere else and did it again and won his own Super Bowl. So he technically should have at least two Super Bowls. Uh, Gruden hasn't done anything of any true meaning since. Uh, as far as putting together winning squads, he's had a couple of opportunities in a couple of different places, and he hasn't been able to replicate what happened in Tampa Bay because he didn't build it. It wasn't his culture. It wasn't his 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 scheme of planning of putting the team together. He just inherited a very talented group of people that were peaking, and he, uh, you know, took them and did what he did, you know, you make a few coaching decisions here and there, but basically you put the team on the field that can go get it, and that's exactly what they did. In the situation here, uh, why I'm here now talking about this again is everybody's scrambling now because this lawsuit is out and the spotlight is once again on the NFL for what the spotlight seems to always be on the NFL about racist BS and racist on the You gotta understand, when you got 32 teams 31 of them have white owners, another has an Arab owner, and the average age of these owners is 70 or 72. You can imagine the mindset that goes on. You can imagine some of the conversations that take place in these owners' meetings. Uh, it, it would be foolish to think that you're dealing with the uh, liberated minds when the, almost every person in that room can remember when black people couldn't even eat in the same spaces, use the same restrooms or water fountains. So you got to understand that, you know, it's just there. And then they're wealthy, and not rich, wealthy white men, which have another whole level of elitism where they don't like a whole lot of white people. So you got to imagine that they deal with black people because they have to, because black people are the commodity. 72% of your league is black. So you, you you gotta deal with us on some level. And we're how we're how you're lining your pockets. Okay. That's that. So in essence, they chose, Miami Dolphins chose Mike McDaniel to replace uh Blind Flores, a black coach that they fired, after he took a horrible team and literally won more games than they expected over the course of it. He almost ended up with a 500 season. When the first year he was expected not to win a game and he won five, uh, that put him on a course where he's improved and he had his team in a ch uh, chance to really do something. Uh, and they underperformed. His starting quarterback was out for a good portion of the season and they still got out there and they played, and they played hard for him. You know, he was building a culture, which you have to have time to do. Uh, he was building a culture. Well, anyway, uh, they bring in Mike McDaniels. Now, the reason we're talking about Mike McDaniels is because at first glance, at any look, in any way, in any other form, you observe Mike. Everything about Mike says white. White, I mean, lily white wife, white child. And he, in all uh, observations, appears to be white. But it seems that old Mike has a great grandfather somewhere who a grandfather grandma someone someone down the the lineage line that's biracial and a part of that uh biracial makeup is black and 
that therefore qualifies Mike to be black, they say. Now, what is, what is funny is they are basically using a concept of philosophy uh, and po practice policy in the past where it used to be one drop of black blood made you black. Matter of fact, I knew I grew up believing that. I, I grew up believing that one drop of black blood made you black. Um, and what, what is interesting about that, no one ever used the reverse because the vast majority of us that are descendants of slaves are not 100% pure uh, African descent. Very few of us are. Um, and But nobody ever said one drop of white blood makes you white. So the idea initially was if you have even a drop of white blood in you, I mean, it, a drop of black blood in you, you're tainted because it wasn't supposed to be a good thing to be black. You know, uh, the the very notion of the idea creates an inferiority complex and it can lead to self-hatred because basically they only want the purest white people to get the privileges of whiteness. If you got any black in you, you don't qualify. They want a pure race. This came from that eugenics program. But I'm getting to something. Okay. But now, they, they want to try to flip that same philosophy. One drop of black blood makes you black. But now it's not for the sake of benefiting black people. The first time it was for the sake of blocking black people out from anything worthy or that could give them an advantage and now it's being used to include white people in something that has been held for black people, certain spaces to, incure, uh, to ensure equality. And now it's being used to include white people. So black people lose on both sides of the argument. One minute, one, one, at one point it's meant to block you out, at the other point it's meant to let them in. And neither point does it benefit you. But you have to understand the true game that's being played here. This is a game of visual semantics. What do I mean by that? Uh, verbal semantics is a word, a play on words. You know, you have a disagreement about something. You might mean the same thing, but you're arguing about the use of the word that de defines or identifies what you said. Well, this is visual semantics. This is saying that we are actually doing something positive for the black race when we all understand that this isn't simply about a phenotype or even simply about melanation. This is about an identity. <coughs> At what point has he ever identified as a black or African-American? <coughs> At what point has he ever been observed and considered to be black or an African-American? Who would look at him and assume he was black or African American. And why is that important? Because it's not just about giving black coaches and black GMs a chance at taking on roles and performing and producing and showing that we are capable. It's, it's not simply about that advantage for that person. It's also about the image portrayed. And this is the important part them is portrayed and presented to the masses because if you get a black coach on the field in a high profile situation like professional football now what you're seeing is a bunch of children looking and saying man I could do that man he's up there doing what those white guys are doing because it's this automatic assumption that white guys do all the stuff right and we know that's not true but that's the thing that it's always been there. It's always been. That was a point in time. Be honest. You ought to, that was a point in time. If you grew up during my time, at least, that was a point in time that until I got around white people, because, you know, until I got to middle school, I was never around white people. And then again, I went to all black high school on, on, out of choice. Uh, and, I, and I'm glad I did one of the best experiences I, I, I ever had. But uh, I went to a magnet school. Uh, for middle school and so I was around white kids, Asian kids 
and even some uh, Latino kids, but definitely white kids and Asian kids. And for the first time, I found out that being white doesn't automatically make you smart. You know, uh, because you speak a certain way doesn't automatically qualify you for being intellectually superior. You just speaking a language that's a part of your culture, the way your culture speaks it doesn't make you smarter than me. And I learned that. I learned that, hey, man, I, I got something going on here. I can, I can go with these kids. These kids aren't better than me. And it taught me something. And, and, and then I didn't really want to be around them, but I, 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 in my middle school career, I got to learn that they weren't better than me. And then I decided to go around and be around people who looked like me. And I chose my high school. My high school didn't choose me. My, my setting didn't choose me. My grandparents didn't choose it. I chose it. And I went there and it was the best experience I had. I was around some other extremely intelligent black people. Shout out to the classes of Forrest Brook, 1982 to 1986, 1987 to 1988. I know y'all youngsters too. Uh, but I mean, I, I mean, there are some exceptionally sharp and smart people, but you wouldn't know it. But the thing is, you're in a situation where you are getting kids to see black people in positions that have been traditionally held for white people and killing it. That does so much for what they see in themselves because we do see ourselves in adults when we're young and we aspire to things. That's why so many kids are aspiring to athletes because that's the pin. Athletes and, and entertainers are the pinnacle of what most black kids see. We, black kids know there are black doctors out there, but how many black doctors do they get to see on a weekly basis? How many times do they get to turn on their television and see black doctors uh, or black lawyers? So while they know they exist, they are not a direct influence because they don't see them. And so they don't get to see the humanity in them, which makes them human and mean that if they're human, if they can do it, I can do it. And this is all things that their subconscious are working out for them. It doesn't even take a whole lot of critical thought. It's just natural subconscious uh, maneuvering that says, hey man, he's black, I'm black. He's doing that, I can do it. But when you're sitting up and saying, okay, he qualifies as black, but he looks white, then there's no benefit out, even if he is black. And I say that uh, with a, a tinge of sarcasm and and a bunch of other stuff but even if he is black because he does not present black because nothing about him presents black he's not married to a black woman he doesn't have a child that looks black he everything about him says white and because of that no black child is going to identify with him so nobody if he was black the only person only black person that would benefit from him being hired is him and his white black kid so i said all that to say this Man, I'm getting like my grandfather. Uh, it's back to me. It's back to the original argument. We will never be able to control the narrative until we own. No matter how much talent we bring to the table, we will never write the narrative because we are not in the position of power. And since we're not in the position of power, we're left holding what is handed to us. And the problem is when you come from a situation where a significant part, portion of your people are below the poverty line, another large group is at the poverty line and many are slightly above it, being handed million dollar plus multi-million dollar contracts is hard to pass by and it makes you feel like you've arrived. You're talking about a lead. The last I checked, I don't know, it's been a while since I messed around with, with, with what's going on in the league uh, and whatever, but last I checked the minimum the minimum salary in the NFL was 200 grand. And the people who were getting 200 grand aren't doing a whole lot. You know, There were some kickers who got $300,000, $400,000 a year. Some get more than that. Uh, depending on how good they are and how much, you know, and whatever. But, you know, you got some people making minimum, it's 200,000 200, a year to go to practice three or four days a week, show up and play on uh, Sunday. Uh, and, you know, be off for a while, then come back, train and practice. Do what it is you, to maintain and sustain yourself. But you're doing something you supposedly love and you're getting paid extremely well for it. 
And it's easy to take that and say, you know what, I've arrived. But the truth of the matter is you're missing the opportunity because if you were an anomaly, what do I mean by that? Say for instance, if there were only 15% of the league were black, then you can sit up and say, man, it's just good to be here making this money. Ain't too many of us here. I'm never the way thinking of that way. I'm always thinking I'm just as good or better than anybody out there. Never thinking anybody's better than me, ever. Okay, so, but if it was only 15%, then you get up there and say, hey man, I'm in here, you know, they control it. I'm gonna get what I can. I'm gonna do what I can for my family and my people with what I earn. But when you make up 72% of the league, you should have some ownership, some stake in it. And I've, I've taught this in, 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 in group economics courses. One of the principal rules of group economics is if you dominate spending or dominate talent in any industry, you should also dominate ownership. There's no way that you are the commodity and you have no say so in the industry. You have not managed your movements well. You have not, have not leveraged your talent. Leveraging your talent isn't what you get in a contract. Lever le leveraging your talent is what you get in control. Same way in the music industry. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw the movie Ray. One of the things that made Ray you know, such an exceptional uh, influence over so much time is he leveraged his talent. He negotiated ownership of his masters when he got ready to make his major deal. That's the only way they got him is he was saying, okay, you can come get me from these people who put me on. These people put me on. But if you want me, the money isn't going to be enough. I want to own my masters. And you know, he was asking for stuff that white white guys with big names weren't getting, you know. Uh, and so he ends up with it. But what he knew is I'm the talent. I get to write the narrative because I'm the talent. Without me, you get none of it. And that's it. You know, you don't get anything if I'm not at the table. So... I'm not just going to be happy with being at the table. I'm going to sit at the head of this table. And if I can't sit at the head of the table, then I'm going to go create my own damn table. Then I'm going to invite other people who look like me to be at the table. And then we're going to control the table exactly how we want to. And we're going to have nobody wanting to be at your table. Because we are the talent. And I just had to sit up, I had to dress. I'm like, dude, just how black are you? And I mean, I would have rather them just hire him and give him the job than to throw this black bull crap out there and expect us. And th there'll be some that'll be good. Well, you know, we got, you know, his his great great grandmother on his on his mama's side uh once once had a boyfriend who was black, so he black. I'm not and, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not here to define how much blood you gotta have black to make you black. Blackness is an experience. It's a lived experience. It's a state of mind. It's an identity. There are some black people, black people that ain't black. There's black race and then there's blackness. And to me, I'm not gonna tell a person, okay, because you're biracial. You're not black. Maybe you're not. Maybe you are. Your life will tell if you're black. Your life will tell you're black. You're, you know, my thing is, I think that we've invited a lot of people in who don't truly identify. We've invited a lot of people in who aren't really good for us. We've got a, invited a lot of people in who will take the first opportunity to use their biracial or a uh, lighter complexion and tone to get advantages and not look down on us. Uh, none of those people deserve to be within the fold. And then there are some people who have significant amount of white blood in them, but black. And it's no doubt about them. And I, I mean, look at some of our 70s revolutionaries. You know, several of them uh, 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 were, were, were very like complected sisters. Um, uh, 
Eldridge Cleaver's wife. I cannot think of her name to save my life. Uh, the other sister that got in trouble. I don't know why they're not coming to my mind as much as I've read, read about them. But they definitely weren't 100% black. <laughs> but their blackness stood out. They identified as black. They owned blackness. They totally rejected their whiteness. Malcolm X wasn't 100% black. I mean, I mean, so I'm not going to be the one to sit up and say, okay, because you, you, you weren't from the tribe of whoever, you're not black. I'm going to sit up and say, there are certain times you can just look at what somebody's doing and say bullshit. And we've got to be careful of letting that one drop rule force us to allow people into the fold that don't belong. I don't think it's the amount. I think it's the experience and the identity. There are people who own it. And I ain't going to take it away from them. If you own it and you truly own it and you're going out there, you ready to die for it? Shit. I can't, I can't argue with that. Who was going to sit up and tell Malcolm he wasn't black? So that that's what I'm talking about. You know, uh, I know that I have several other ethnicities or races within me. I don't care. I don't even want to know what they are. Doesn't matter. I'm not going out. Um, whether it's Irish or Welsh, whatever it is. Nothing. I have lived an experience of the black man. My father and grandfather lived the experience of the black man. I'm walking in my blackness till my behind stops breathing and I'm going to go hard in the paint for my people. And that's it. You know, I, I mean, it is what it is. But I just had to bring that up and talk about it. And again, like I said, we need your support. So if you believe in the work we're doing and we are going hard in the paint. And right now is the time that black boys really need us. We have a spike in suicide and suicide attempts, suicidal ideations, uh, mental health crisis. We really truly need to be able to service all of that. And we don't need it to be a resource issue. We are offer, offering other wraparound services and I'm going to be more inclined to get you more information on all that within the coming days but we need your support the link is going to be right there in the description box i'm challenging you to support our work on that note i am out <laughs>